This is Gareth Southgate, and this is the Three Lions Podcast. And welcome to the Three Lions podcast. My name is Russell Osborne and this is where we take a look at our national football team. Thank you for all your recent feedback on the uh, the recent episodes. The reaction to the futsal one was amazing. Uh, I only hope in some way we've managed to open a few more eyes to the game and its current predicament. And if you signed the petition off of hearing it, thank you. Totally made it worthwhile. Now, you can still hear it at 3 com or your usual podcast platform if you haven't already. Now, coming up on this episode, we'll reflect back on the three games England have played in this window with a couple of England bloggers, Aidan Smith and Matt Astbury. Now, before the futsal episode, we had the preview one in which I referred back to the squad incidents for the first set of Nations League games. Maguire, Foden and Greenwood, uh, with the hope that this squad didn't have any more unplanned dramas. How wrong could I have been? Following Chelsea's home win over Crystal Palace, Tammy Abraham was given a surprise party to celebrate his 23rd birthday. No problems in that. Under normal circumstances, no. But on this occasion, the party was attended by more than six people which included fellow England teammates Ben Chilwell and Jaden Sancho. And of course, in this day and age when everyone has a camera phone, pictures of the gathering quickly emerged and subsequently the trio were asked to arrive at St George's Park after the main squad did. And it was later announced that they would miss the Wales game as the FA investigated. Now, all later apologised for their actions. But it's so frustrating, the recent antics by players. I'm not going to go through a roll call of them, but too many England players have been caught up in breaking of government rules since March, April time. And I've said before, I know the majority of them are young, but it's no excuse. Unfortunately, this is a time when they all need to be growing up quickly. They are, through their own wanting, in a high-profile career where the media want and will take every inch of them for better or worse. Whilst Marcus Rashford has done amazing deeds for underprivileged children and families and rightly been awarded an MBE for it, I think sadly people may well remember more Marcus Greenwood over this period. I don't know the answer to this situation. I'm not sure Gareth Southgate and the FA do either, as at times the messages that come from them seem a little inconsistent. Perhaps it's me. As I get a little older, I look at these situations in a different light. I guess there's nothing new with England players making the news for the wrong reasons. Tony Adams was a hero of mine growing up. Paul Merson too. And of course, John Terry had off-the-field affairs. Ashley Cole had an incident with an air rifle. Wayne Rooney often hit the front pages for extracurricular activities. And probably best we don't mention Adam Johnson. The fact is, these players are in the public eye and played for England. What and how they do is up to them. But when it can affect the England team, it just becomes a little embarrassing. And the vast majority of us are fortunate that we don't have newspapers following us about. But even going back to 96 and the dentist chair, although it could be said that maybe galvanised the team. But I wonder how these incidents get seen across the world. Do other countries have similar problems? Do they care about us? Do we want a team of do-gooders? I'm probably spending too much time thinking about it. because really results on the pitch that matter. Perhaps it's because of the times that we're in that frustrates me more, as the rules are there for all of us. Anyway, squad-wise... Raheem Sterling, he pulled out of that squad, citing injury. And in his place was a call-up for Chelsea's Rhys James, who came on and made his England debut against Wales. And that 
is where we start. So first up was Wales at home, Thursday the 8th of October. And if the B team was still a thing, I think it's safe to assume uh, that this would have been classed as a B game in days gone by. Two players making their debuts, Dominic Calvert-Lewin and Saka. Michael Keane playing. I think it's safe to say he's down the pecking order of centre-backs. Nick Pope, for the time being, he's behind Jordan Pickford in Gareth's thinking. Yet it gave another chance for Jack Grealish to impress. And that's what the point of these friendlies are to give the manager and his staff a few headaches. And here to talk a little bit more about it is Aidan Smith from the website 3lions.net. Aidan, you all right? Hi, I'm very good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, all good, thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us. We've not spoken before, have we? We haven't spoken, no. Uh, but you are head of the website 3lions.net. Yeah, I am indeed. Uh, started that in the summer and hopefully it should be a long-lasting website. Good stuff. Enjoy doing it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it's, uh, we're all England fans, aren't we? So uh, yeah, of course, it's a uh, it's a privilege. And you, is sort of journalism something you're you're looking at, or as, as well, doing? possibly? Yeah, journalism is is the kind of area that I'm looking to go into. So yeah, this won't harm my chances, will it? Not at all. Well, uh, yeah, always keeping tabs on it um, and uh, and retweeting the, the articles as and when um, they come out. And and your most recent um, article concerning the Wales game, I think we're uh, we're talking along the same lines here as you, you headed it with Southgate's reserves give food for thoughts. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I thought uh, it was, it was as you say, more of a, a B team, I guess, if that's still a thing. Yeah. <laughs> But I was I was absolutely delighted with the performance. It was a fantastic way to hit back at uh, perhaps disappointing performances last month. But equally, it was a great way to answer some of the headlines that have been going around regarding, you know, COVID rules and 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 some of the perhaps silly situations that have that have occurred in the last month or two. Yeah, it wasn't the ideal preparation, was it? No, not really. No. Uh, but you see, as Gareth's come through it um, quite well, the team have done what they needed to. It's a bit of a strange game, though, and I guess probably in the main because we, as supporters, couldn't go. Um, ever so strange seeing Wembley empty and England playing, isn't it? Yeah, it was. It was very strange, actually, yeah. And Wales being a home nation opposition, I, I guess... It, it was a friendly, uh, but it just didn't seem to have that needle that a traditional home nations game would would usually have to it. No, it didn't. I mean, Gareth did say that there's no such thing as a friendly recently. And, uh, you know, he is right. And it's, there's kind of part of his job. He's got to say that, hasn't he? But um, <laughs> I think he was he was he was talking sense there and. It didn't have the spice that perhaps some of the home nation matches we've seen in the past did, but um, nonetheless, it wasn't it wasn't a poor game to watch from a neutral perspective, was it? No, not at all. I mean, Wales they uh, they came out strongest really to start with, without really without really threatening us. But they uh, yeah they came out stronger, and and I guess it was only when Dominic Calvert Lewin scored that we uh, we took the game from them. Yeah, they did. It was sort of 20, 25 minutes of them kind of quite happy to to just keep the ball as far from from our high press as possible, really. I think we, I, I must say, I think we were incredibly well structured off the ball in the first 20 minutes. Perhaps that's something that we expected from Wales and, 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 and something that was talked about in training. I don't know, but but it did look extremely pleasing to see us off the ball so so well formed and then as you say it didn't take two or three minutes of uh, of taking taking back possession before we took the lead i mean it say it was a, a debut goal for the man in form dominic calvert lewin i don't know if you saw this stat but apparently he was the 188th player to score on his england debut Really? I yeah. Wow, I would never have guessed there would have been that many. Exactly. Well, it's my my thoughts exactly. The 188 players, considering we've played, well, I believe that was our 1,007th game, I think that was. So, uh, yeah. Right, OK, yeah. It's, it's quite a stat, and as and far as I'm aware, it is true. <laughs> I mean, the, the goal came from the Grealish cross, didn't it? Um, and he was probably rightly the uh, the man of the match. He had a great game, didn't he? 
Yeah, I think um, he definitely would have seen that when he saw his name on the on the starting eleven. He would have been jumping for joy because that's exactly his kind of game where he can make an impact. And I think the formation worked to his strength as well. It was interesting to see the decision making from the coaching staff regarding the formation. I mean, we saw last month for both of the games we opted for the three four three formation. I think probably the intention is that that will be a backup formation for the Euros, but who knows? But then it was uh, it was interesting to see Grealish sort of play as a, a number 10 behind the two central strikers instead of a, a flat three up front. Yes, yeah. I mean, he, uh, he's he got to be one for uh for the well for the future i mean the immediate future i mean this this friendly where where gareth has picked a few players to sort of look at but there's going to be players there that he's going to think right yeah you're going to be um not not dead cert for the next game but you're certainly in my thinking to be playing against belgium and denmark and i'm sure um jack grealish is one of those isn't he yeah he is um i think especially if we if we are going to stick with this 343 formation which I'm assuming we probably will. It is beneficial against some of the better sides. Then he would he would certainly be a good impact player to bring off the bench, similar to a Mason Mount, who again played fantastically when he came on last night. But uh, uh, Grealish will be de- perhaps slightly disappointed that Sancho has been allowed to uh, to continue with the squad this time around. <laughs> I mean, he he was, as I say, he provided the uh, the cross for the first goal. He was the man fouled for the uh, the second goal. I mean, he had a few fouls on him last night, as is a uh, as is the way for Jack Grealish. Which then, Kieran Trippier produced the free kick for Connor Cody to uh, to score. And I mean, I don't know what I liked more was was the goal how he took it or or the smile and the celebration. Well, I, I'm going to have to say that the smile and the celebration won it for me. I mean. Uh... <laughs> It was just so such a breath of fresh air to to see an England player and, and, and what it meant to him as well, not just to play, but to score. And then a few minutes later to take the armband as well off Kieran Trippier in just his second cap for the national side. I mean, it's it's a remarkable story, really, isn't it? But absolutely. He's had a, he's had a long road into the England setup. Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's not young. He's 27. I'm I'm delighted for him. I really am, and you can you could hear it in his interview post match as well, couldn't you? Yes, yeah, absolutely. He was saying about his kids and saying that the uh, the game will be played uh, over and over at home. But yeah, as you say, he's taken taken a little while to get into that senior team because he was a uh, he was a regular in the in the young Lions teams. He, he has done his homework on the England front. It's just taken him a little while to get this place. And I, for one, think he's probably got an eye on a regular place because that centre back position. Could be anyone's really, couldn't it? It's certainly up for grabs. We could say that there's probably just a handful, maybe maybe five or six at the moment that are pushing for starting places at centre back, and it's it's sort of similar to to a couple of the other positions in that there's a lot of a lot of depth at the moment and and growing like we saw last night, but um, it's it's up for grabs for someone to take it and make the strength. Not just this game, but it was the the Denmark game, Denmark away last month, where um, it was it was well noted how vocal he is on the pitch, and and that certainly uh, certainly got it going for him, hasn't it? Yeah, definitely, and and especially in the middle of a back three as well, it's going to be pivotal. Mm. I mean, and shortly after that goal, uh, we got a third one, uh, and who doesn't love an overhead kick, do we? I mean, Danny Ings there. Yeah, fantastic from Danny Ings. And I was I was delighted to see both Calvert Lewin and Danny Ings get a goal. I mean, it's long overdue that that we have some sort of backup uh, understudy striker who can come on with a reputation for scoring goals for the national side. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean he uh is another player so he'll probably be on the bench for for Belgium and Denmark, but as you say he can come on, he can he can do the business as can Dominic Calvert Lewin. But I mean, even if we go right back to to between the sticks, Nick Pope there, clean sheet. He didn't have a great deal to to do, and what he did, he done he done fine, didn't he? So six games now that England have played with a uh, with a clean sheet. Yeah, well, I think you hit the nail on the head there. He didn't have much to do, but he but he did what he had to do. Absolutely spot on. I think um, he's uh, he's one of the men in form at the moment for England and. Again, another position that really is up for grabs and uh, it's so close to call at the moment between the three of them and it's it's certainly hard to predict what Gareth Southgate's going to do each game. 
Yeah, he, he does have that up his sleeve. He's, he's very unpredictable, is Gareth. Um, I mean, because this starting 11, just 54 caps between them. Now, out of those players that, that started last night, how do you see him going for Belgium with those players? Is it going to be a full change or is he going to keep one or two? How do you see it? Well, I'm, I'm not too sure. As you've touched on there, the, the amount of caps was was minimal, really. It was, mm. in fact, uh, I mentioned in my article that it, the caps of uh, of the starting eleven added up to less than Ben Davis's caps, who was the Wales captain last night. Right, which is right. Qu- quite remarkable, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think Gareth is sure to make quite a few changes. I mean, he's given a few hints, hasn't he? Especially keeping players like. Eric Dyer, Jordan Henderson, Harry Kane out of the out of even the substitutes. They were just there to watch last night, weren't they? So yeah. he's uh, he's clearly keeping them. Whether we'll see anyone return, I'm not too sure. That's uh, as we said, Gareth is very unpredictable. Um, I'm sure a couple of those players from last night will have done their chances no harm uh, for coming on the bench on, on from the bench at least. Yeah, no, I think you're right. He's uh, he does like to keep his cards very close to his chest, and I think no one really uh, put a foot out of place. I don't think last night did they? Oh, really? Not- Mason Mount came on. He had a uh, had was was highly productive. Perhaps Ainsley Maitland Niles was a little bit quiet, but no, I think it was Saka had a good start. It was it was a a good all in all performance from the uh, from the England side that kind of hopefully puts those two games against Iceland and Denmark to bed. Yeah, I mean, it's never going to be the same kind of atmosphere when you play a friendly, perhaps the uh, with with no pressure comes a, a, a freer performance, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, we saw players like Michael Keane have what was a pretty solid game, whereas, you know, you might not have expected that from Michael Keane in the form that he's in. But again, when when it's when it's just a friendly, I mean... It's it's a real chance for you to put your mark down on the position. Yeah, no, I think you're right. So it'll be uh, be interesting to see how we uh, how we attack Belgium because obviously there are Wales without the likes of Gareth Bale and Aaron Ramsey. Unfortunately, are a uh, a little bit weaker, but Belgium will be certainly a, a step up. But hopefully, we've got the uh, hopefully we've got the players that can that can do this in this Nations League game, and and we can uh, we can get three points in this one. Yeah, it would be delightful to break Belgium down. I mean, the win in Spain in in Seville in 2018 was was a a, a really good moment, uh, especially in Southgate's reign. And if we can do it again, then it's it's taking us some way towards challenging in the Euros. I think it's it's one of those signs pre tournament that that other that other teams will get worried at. Let's hope so. Aidan Smith from threelions.net, which is, which is a great website uh, with regular articles on there about England. And, and we've got any more coming up soon? Oh, of course, yeah. Well, in the international break, all the focus will be on the matches or the uh, or the squad, which which I, I, I put an article out about the squad uh, when it came out. So, yeah, we'll wait for a couple more match reports. And then after that, we'll see what's to come. Lovely. Look forward to it. Aidan, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, let's let's speak again. Yeah, I'd love to, Russell. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. So after Wales, it was on to Belgium and Denmark, both Nations League games with points at stake. And here with me to talk about those is fellow England Travel Club member and England blogger and general all-round sports blogger, Matt Asprey. Hey, Matt. Hi, Ross. How are you doing? Not too bad. Thank you. Yourself? Uh, good, thank you. But managed to keep uh, as normal as possible in these strange times. Yeah, it's very strange, very strange. Good to hear, though, you're, uh, you're still plodding along. Um, because you you work for for a a sports TV company, I believe, wasn't it? When we spoke previously, yeah, I'm still working there. It's a streaming company called the Zone. They don't um, operate in the uh, UK yet, but uh, they they stream live sports across um, Europe and especially in uh, North America. It's an exciting industry to be in. Nice one. Uh, well, let's crack on then. Belgium and Denmark. So after that Wales game, 3-0 win over Wales, we moved on to Belgium. And I must admit, initially, I was like, oh, I don't, don't know how we're going to do against Belgium until I saw that uh, they were down a few players, weren't they, before kickoff? 
Yes, I mean, I think in terms of uh, this England team development now, this is the one bonus of the Nations League, as much as people when the international break came along were saying, oh, it's just a waste of time, is that the England team do get some quality opponents. And even though Belgium were a few players down, there were still some big names in there. You've got Kevin De Bruyne, Lukaku, just to mention a few. They need a test, and I mean, it doesn't get any bigger than the number one team in the world at the moment. But um, it was an interesting game, to say the least. Yeah, we, we started quite positively, didn't we? Yeah, it seems to be quite a common thing. It seems to be a common thing with the team I support, Manchester City. Like, for some reason, the first 20 minutes or so, we play, we play really well, but there seems to be just some sort of drop-off. It's very weird because I know, obviously, in international football, it, it's generally a lot slower than club football, but seeing that start, if I was playing, I'd have been very encouraged, just been going non-stop, but for some reason, just seemed to take our foot off the gas a bit. And I think when you get onto the goals and uh, other areas of the game, I think the winner from Mason Mount sort of reflects that, because in the fact his goal came off a giant deflection. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, even the, the winner, it wasn't exactly a goal that we worked for, it was a shot that got lucky and went in the back of uh, Mini Lays at the end, but no, it was, again, it was a confidence boost, I'd say, beating Belgium 2-1. Yeah, I mean, it, it caught me by surprise, I must admit, that Mason Mount goal. I thought it was going going way over, and it, I uh, my celebration was a little bit sort of behind, really. I just didn't expect it to, to loop in. But I mean, Belgium, they they showed they are a, a decent team. They, um, they had that initial offside goal chalked off right at the very beginning, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And um, I think the one thing that impresses me with Belgium when I've managed to catch their games if England aren't playing or Belgium are playing at a later or earlier time is that they, they're very much very fluid when they play. They're not exactly, you know, quite robust in terms of they've just got one plan, for example, and just lump up the pitch. They're trying to play as close to a modern style of football as they can. They do have the players to do that. I think um, Kevin De Bruyne is a crucial part of that. And I think Lukaku, he just seems another man in that Belgian team. Obviously, he has been doing wonders for Inter Milan. But, I mean, you know, for, a cent- for an international centre forward, Lukaku is every everything you need. He's powerful. He's technical on the ball as well. Yeah. I mean, if, for a person of his size, he's very technical and very impressive to watch. So, yeah, I think but the, the early warning signs there from Belgium. But, again, from what I... I was going in the build-up. It didn't look, seem like a lot of the Belgian players were really looking forward to this international break. I think quite a lot of them wanted to rest. I mean, I could remember reading in the build-up and it was um, touched a few times on various like, media outlets that Kevin De Bruyne, who is very much their star man, their marquee face of that team now, he's only had about nine days rest, I think, really? between the two seasons. And even then, that nine days was keeping an eye on his partner as she was expecting a, another child. So right. I think uh, quite a lot of those Belgian players were just trying to get through this international break without without getting injured or seriously affecting their uh, their duties um, on a club level. But I think if Bel- I think we played a Belgian team that was more fully up for it and wasn't exactly uh, affected by a very congested calendar, I think England could have been in for a tough. Tough for ninety minutes, judging by that ruled out offside goal. There could have been a lot more of that. Yeah, I mean, we we may well see that stronger Belgian side next month, which we'll uh, no doubt we'll talk about soon. But just to just to remind ourselves about the the game, obviously Eric Dyer brought down Lukaku, which was a which was a little bit clumsy, I thought. I mean, but as you say, Lukaku is is big, strong, and and made the most of that and put his put his penalty away. Uh, and then we we got a. Uh, uh, or another penalty in the game, which uh, Jordan Henderson won, didn't he? And I must admit, when when I looked at it afterwards, I thought, oh dear, I think we've uh, we've we've won a penalty there in inverted commas, didn't we? Yeah, I think um, when we get to the Denmark match, I think a penalty is going to be another <laughs> a questionable penalty call is going to be a topic of conversation. Yeah, it was more or less a tap. Well, I don't even know if it was a tap. It was literally just the hand being placed on Jordan Henderson, and again for a person. Of, it's it's always amazing when it comes to fouls in the box because even the most biggest of the most uh, big large physique players can go down if they get a catch of wind. I mean, it, for Jordan Henderson, I never see someone falling down that quick, but 
I mean, you d- they get given international football. I think when it comes to international refereeing, I think the standard can be very hit and miss. And I think that penalty call was an example of that. And I, I think it's been mentioned before about VAR not being in these Nations League games in the in the group stage games that you think, well, that one may have they may have reviewed that one. We may have not have been so lucky. But as you say that the Denmark one, they may have reviewed that one. And well, we, we may have gotten away with it. It's, it's all very, um, all very up in the air at times. But Marcus Rashford, he put the penalty away. Um, in, in incidentally, those, those nice shiny boots, new boots that he was given after being awarded his MBE, wasn't it? Um, so fair, fair play to him. Uh, but we, we just, we just done really well. I thought in that game, we, we grew into it. And, and I think capitalised on on the fact that Belgium maybe weren't as strong as as they can be. But there was also uh, I looked at Rice and Henderson as well, and I'm, part of me thinks a week back in a uh, a sort of Lampard and Gerrard not being able to play together sort of scenario. Yes, I mean the midfield is going to be. I think before the Euros next year, Southgate needs to sort that central midfield out because. The one way which um, that midfield works, in my opinion, is that you have one player sitting in front of that back four or dropping into that back four if a defender has gone up for a set piece or something or has gone up with the ball. Would you say that should be Henderson? But I'm quite happy with Henderson there. I think he did yeah, plays a part I mean, there. In the World Cup, Henderson came into a world of his own, wasn't he? Because he, was mm. he was that midfielder who, if he received the ball off the back four, his forward passing, he was just pinging the ball all over the pitch like to open England players who were very high up the pitch, was getting to the likes of Ali and Lingard, and they were able to create chances well at the moment. It just seems like I don't know what role each of them has. So I think I think Southgate might have to look back on those World Cup performances and see Henderson was very effective when he was basically the distributor where he'd get the ball and he'd just start the moves off rather yeah. than having to defensive the man midfielders there when really you only need one they need another midfielder who is who is not afraid if he gets the ball to just go straight up the pitch and push England forward rather than having to mess around with the ball in our own half for example yeah, especially on a in a home environment as well we want to be sort of a, attacking the ball I mean if, fair enough if we're going away and and that may well be the case um, when we go to to Belgium, or it might have been if if we were looking for a point or something, but yeah, we we do need to to look at that. I think it's for me, it's just not it's not working um, between Rice and Henderson. We need to be one or the other. You know, totally agree. Yeah. So we we all came away from, or I say came away came away from our sofas basically um feeling pretty pretty pleased as punch that we'd beaten belgium by two goals to one which you think okay going into denmark we'll uh, denmark at home we're going to be be high on confidence yeah i mean it's um it was very i, th- I thought of this very very weird way to look at it it was a bit like a weird three course meal as such we had a great start in that wales game and at the main course that belgium it was it was satisfactory. He came away from it feeling positive, but then this next game against Denmark should have been the icing on the cake, and it was anything but that. Yeah, I mean the even the the starting lineup or when the squad, the team starting eleven was announced, I looked at it and I thought, wow, it's it's just too defensive minded. There, we're we're not not enough sort of attacking options there. Well, I thought the at first before obviously some players that weren't around in Copenhagen, I thought. England basically just copy and pasted the team from the Copenhagen game in September, the nil-nil draw, and just pasted it into the into this game. <laughs> I mean, on social media is just obviously it's very quick fire, very hot headed. But mm-hmm. um, I did when I listened to the podcast reviewing the games in September, I did agree with um, Don Smith who came on. He said obviously you can't just play. It's very easy for someone to play the role as England manager, but even. Last night, even he admitted on Twitter that that lineup just wasn't what just wasn't right. I mean, the one thing that um, everyone was crying out for was Jack Grealish to come in, yeah. and I do agree. But again, for Mason Mount did play really well last night. I think Grealish could go into the centre, but again, Southgate for some reason has this obsession of putting him on the wing. When I think it would have been interesting to see what Henderson and Grealish could have done in that central midfield. Rather than having um, 
Is it Calvin Phillips for Rice in there? That again is just very defensive. It just didn't. The midfield just doesn't excite me. It's going to be now that when I looked at the team, there was a gap. You had the back four, and you had just a giant midfield gap of just players that won't really get us forward. Then you had the likes of Kane, Rashford, and Mount up there, but just it, it just didn't lack any flair. I mean, what what do you think it is about Grealish? I mean, we all know as supporters what he's capable of, but what doesn't Gareth? What can't Gareth see that we can see? I don't. I mean, there's. I mean, Gareth Southgate gets to watch a lot of football. He has to. It's part of his job, but. Does he go to Aston Villa that much? I mean, <laughs> I, I, we knew something was up when he selected Calvin Phillips in the September squad, and yet he hadn't made a start in the Premier League. And then he made that comment about Grealish a few months before, saying before you get in this England squad, you've got to make regular appearances in the Premier League. And I mean, judging by how he played for Aston Villa, how he's been playing for Aston Villa this season, I thought Grealish would be a shoo but I don't know what the problem is. Again, as I said before, he seems fixated on putting Grealish on the wing when I put him in, in the centre midfield, either in the midfield or just behind the striker. Yeah. Because he is that midfielder that England need, and it, that midfielder who will run with the ball, because that's what they're lacking. They're lacking someone in midfield who can run at def- run at uh, opposite opposition defences with the ball. Yeah, I mean, you can put Grealish and Mount in the same team, because Mount, he's staked his claim now, because yeah. he's, he's work off the ball last night even though England lost, even Rhys James on that right-hand side, obviously both Chelsea teammates, but they just worked so well. They were concentrating chances. That was one of the only positives that came out of that Denmark game. But the greatest question, I mean, we're all confused. We don't know what he has to do, but I mean, someone's got to go to Gareth Southgate and just go, can you stop trying to shoehorn Mason Mount into any question about Jack Greenish because it's becoming a bit of a running joke now. <laughs> yes, it's unfortunate. Um, I mean, just just to recap on it, we had um, Maitland Niles and Rich James came in and oh, Cody was in for Dyer as well. But Harry Maguire, unfortunately, we've got, we've got to talk about that. Silly early yellow and obviously his, his poor touch and sort of rash challenge for his for his red card. I mean, I don't want to really sort of... It's an England podcast. I don't really want to talk about club sides, Manchester United and that. But it's it's no... It's not a secret he's having a, a bit of a bad patch at the moment. Just just all round, is it? I mean, it's just been a whirlwind few months for him, hasn't it? I mean, you don't, we, as you said, we want to try and keep positive. We don't want to delve into what's going on in his head and things like that. But I think, um, I think now, after this break, I think it would be... He does need a break, I think, from football. I mean, obviously, it's not going to happen because he's got he's a mate, he's a crucial man for Manchester United, but his head just isn't in the right place. And I think the best thing people could do because I saw when he got sent off, you know, some even some journalists and some fans were you know really criticising him. I think that's the work. This is what affected England players in the past, and I think and I thought with this current side, we've got past that stage of as soon as players do awful, jumping on their back and, you know, just constantly giving them giving them criticism. But I think now he just needs an arm around him. I think he just needs some support from his coaches, from teammates, just to go, look, we know what you're going through. If you need any support or anything, let us know. And I think he's just got to, I think he's just got to come through this rough patch. I think he will, because he's a quality player. But again, every player seems to have these patches where they just can't seem to get together. So if anything, I just... I hope he, he can just get through this bad run of form. And I mean, if he's not set in the November squad, I think that might be a good decision. Give him a break for internationals, give him that week off in November just to refocus and hopefully it'll come good again in time for next summer. Yeah, so it was a bit of a bit of reshuffling at the back when he went off. Um, as I say, Cody was in that that back line, as was Kyle Walker. Um, they shuffled around, and and that brings us on to the uh, brings us on to the penalty, which happened pretty much two minutes later after um, Harry Maguire had, had gone. Another strange, strange situation, and we haven't even. Well, I guess this is where we mention the referee as well, because let's, let's be honest, he didn't have the best game. Yeah, I don't know how it was a penalty. That's all I can say. I don't know how. I don't know where the penalty was. What it was called for. I mean, even on commentary in the half time when analysing it, everyone was just like, "How is that? Where's the penalty there?" Couldn't because, fathom it, could they? Uh, there was no. No one really went down as such. I mean, if anything, it was Carl Walker blocking off Jordan Pickford, 
it wasn't even the Denmark player who was causing the problem. It was two England players who didn't communicate that well and just came into each other. I don't know. I was baffled, but I mean, that's international football. Sometimes it happens. And I mean, it was. Just, I was just sat there just like, I was just shrugging my shoulders like, I just don't know anymore. <laughs> I must admit, I felt a little bit for Walker because he had a good game um, against Belgium, I thought. Yeah, Carl Walker's really um, got back into the England fold because, I mean, there's a few questions over whether he would ever get back in after, was his last appearance before September, the Nations League games? Well, yeah, I mean, he got sent off, sent off against Iceland there, didn't he? Yeah, in his club form, he's seen a massive improvement and I think now he's really cemented himself into that England side because, I mean... He was playing left back, wasn't he, last night? Because, I, because yeah. England don't seem to have a left. They don't seem to have a proper left back. So they just throw. Cole, they just throw any right sided left back in. <laughs> Obviously, Kieran Trippier is out of the squad for other reasons. But no, I mean, again, he's just, he provides that pace that England need from the back if they want to quickly pounce on a uh, counter attack. So no, he's he's looking really good. And as I said, it always seems to happen with Carl Walker. He seems to play really well, and then just there's always a blip that everyone remembers his performance for. So, for example, in Iceland, it's going to be the sending off. While against um, Denmark, it's a penalty, which wasn't a penalty, which I think everyone should just forget about and that sort of thing happens. But no, he has played really well. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's a crucial part of Southgate's teams uh, at the Euros, obviously in November when we've got to travel to Brussels. Yeah, I mean, the one positive, I guess, that we can try and take from last night, uh, from the Denmark game, is the fact that we, we were down to 10 men um, and we, I mean, it's arguably we uh, we stepped up in the way we played. Um, OK, we didn't we didn't really, it took us an hour to, to really get any shot on target and test Schmeichel, but, but we didn't look too bad with 10 men. You've hit the nail on the head. Um, if it was an England team from a few years ago, I'd be very worried. I thought we could be having a few, it could be three, four or five, but I think uh, even though Southgate at first got quite a bit of criticism from taking Nathan Niles off as soon as uh, McGraw was sent off, but he made the right decision. He brought another centre-back. He shored up the back four. Yeah, no, it was very positive to see. And the thing is, I mean, the Denmark team, they did get a few chances, but they also were squ- they were also wasting possession quite uh, often as well. I mean, Christian Eriksen had some obsession with trying to score an absolute screamer. He just yeah. kept firing the ball over the bar for what uh, for three points every time. So I think the fact that they were starting to frustrate Denmark when they started taking shots from range. And also, yeah, I mean, obviously a few deflections went our way and a few, uh, chan- a few Denmark's chances went our way. But no, I think... Seeing the fact that England could hold it as a 10 men, I mean, it just post positive for the future. Let's say if that does happen, if there is a questionable decision in the next uh, round of Nations League games or in uh, the Euros next year, I think it just shows that we can we get a result, hopefully. But obviously, you know, in those circumstances, a knockout tie, for example, they've got to go and get the goal. And they do certainly have the uh, firepower to do that. Uh, well, let's hope so. Well, let's hope it doesn't come down to that. But yeah, it's, it's good to see that they uh, they have got a little bit of grit there to to go and do that should the situation arise. But um, I mean, we mentioned Harry Maguire got sent off, and and Reece James unfortunately sort of tarnished his evening by. Uh, I don't know if he said something at the end there, but unfortunately he got himself sent off after uh, after the game had finished. And I believe that's the first time England have officially had two players sent off in a uh, in a game but unfortunately that one didn't matter on the pitch yeah I mean it does touch you because Reese James did play really well as I mentioned uh, earlier but yeah I think <laughs> obviously emotions run high and that sort of thing but you know as a player who has um, got his first chance to you know represent England I mean he, he should have just walked off I mean it's just one of those nights it happens and yeah hopefully it's a learning experience for him but no it wasn't great to see two players sent off no. So, I mean, going forward to November, we, we've seen this New Zealand game has been knocked on the head. Whether we'll get a a, a replacement in, we we wait and see. But we, we go to Belgium and then we've got Iceland at home. We can still get through if, if results go away. We win both our games and I think we would finish potentially top, would we? Yes, I mean, I think that's the only uh, option is just get two wins and then see how the table looks at the end. Again, it's just a, it gets annoying there won't be any fans because Belgium, when the draw was made, Belgium away was a trip that I was I was already making plans to make a real uh, trip out of it. But no, I think um, 
a trip to Brussels should be uh, an interesting one. I mean, England will have to go there and get results. If they can do it once, there's no reason why they can't do it again. And Iceland should be a formality at Wembley, surely. I mean, it's a bit different to uh, playing Reykjavik, but England should comfortably uh, dispatch Ireland. But no, there should be an exciting climax to the Nations League group stage. Here's a scenario, and providing the, the Euros are on next year, which obviously we all, we all hope we are, hope they are, do we go and win it by playing how we've done and possibly stinking the whole tournament out? Or do we go out in the semi-finals at home, obviously it's being played at, at Wembley, on penalties by playing nice, great attacking football that we all want to see? I'll, I'm going to be pretty honest, I'd rather stick the whole place out and win the whole thing. <laughs> yes. It, it's, I'd, I just want to get through my lifetime seeing England win a tournament. That's just the thing now. And we got, I mean, it's at home. We've got everything in our favour, haven't we? I mean, yeah. just... As long as we get the fans back in, I think we've got a great chance because everyone who has still held on to their tickets for the Euros is really hoping the state of the world is in right now can really improve because I mean it's going to be a it's going to be a festival of football. I mean it's all well and good going. Oh, I want to seeing them play attractive football. Then people forget about that if you win it. It's a common thing in international tournaments. Not a lot of the teams that win it play scintillating football. I mean it'd be a very German way to. Um, win it in the most playing the most boring style of football but just get that trophy please just get it now <laughs> would be great to see wouldn't it yes it would but let's hope so and and let's hope that it's uh well I'll give you something else to write about go and tell us about your uh about the blog where we can find it uh and that sort of thing yes yeah, so i'm currently in the midst of uh well it might be up by the time this podcast goes live um it's the next installment of the uh england diaries i'm trying to think of a catch name because i've already used a view from the sofa already so we'll have, oh, that's currently uh playing on my mind but yes i matt asprey uh sport is where you can find it um i'm sure there'll be a link in the description or something or when this yeah. goes live i'll tweet a link as well but yeah um one of the positive come out a lot is that i've i've gotten really into golf so i've started writing about golf now okay. as well so just uh keep on that i write about anything or if there's any uh, sporting issues that any listeners want me to uh, take a look into just uh Tell me or let me know, and I'll have a look into it. Sounds good. I uh, I may well do myself. It's slowly growing. I think I'm going to be approaching fifty posts soon, which would be an achievement. So no, it's uh, no, I'm trying to always look for new wa- things to cover, new ways to uh, expand it. Nice one. And, and you on Twitter as well? Yes, uh, at Astbury Matt. So um, again, I think there'll be a handle in uh, when the podcast goes live. But also, yeah, just Astbury Matt on Twitter. Just drop me a follow there. Don't I don't tweet about any uh seriously it's mostly just sports so don't worry if you want to just be a break from the uh crazy uh <laughs> world we're all living in just go there there's usually something stupid i put up up there good stuff matt thank you very much for joining us and uh yeah let's speak again yeah cheers thanks a lot russell thank you to matt there trying to stay positive for us and speaking of positive things let's talk about our young lions because they were away on the 7th of october away to andorra crazy game this one where andorra took the lead and captain tom davies of everton equalized just before half time josh de silva of brentford put us ahead andorra equalized then arsenal's eddie and ketia scored england's third and in doing so equalled the under-21's goal-scoring record, held jointly by Alan Shearer and Francis Jeffers, with 13 goals. However, Andorra weren't done there, and they equalised to make it 3-3 as a final score. Now, the boys needed four points to secure qualification for next year's Euros, and I think the general consensus was that this would be the three points. However, it was only one. But Turkey at Wolves Molyneux was up next on the 13th of October and this, fortunately, saw us qualify with a 2-1 victory. An own goal put us ahead after a great Ryan Sessegnon run. Eddie and Ketia, after equaling that scoring record, thought he'd broken it. But to be pulled up for offside twice, he thought he'd broken it. He then hit the post from the penalty spot before finally breaking the record with 10 minutes to go. Well done to him. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, we'll see him in that first team soon. Turkey pulled one back, but it wasn't enough. 
Uh, and also worth noting that Jude Bellingham had a great game, only 17 years old. Now the under-20s managed by Lee Carsley for the first time, or well, they beat Wales at St George's Park in a friendly, winning 2-0 with goals from Aston Villa's Jacob Ramsey and Hamburg's Javier Amici. And then finally, the under-19s faced Scotland at St George's Park on the 8th of October. And this was eventful. The Young Lions, well, they were leading 3-1 at half-time when it was then abandoned. Now, the official line, that it was in line with Covid protocol and no other details were given. However, later, the Scotland website confirmed that their manager Billy Stark had received a positive test on the afternoon of the game. (laughs) They were due to play each other again after this game but uh, obviously that was postponed. And we've heard about that cancellation of the New Zealand game too. All down to the virus. Blooming coronavirus. It's just it is just a pain in the arse. Crazy that it's affecting us in this way. Anyway Well done to all our young Lions who were in action. Now we've looked at the men, we've looked at the young Lions. Let's wrap up this episode with a quick chat about the Lionesses, who come the end of this month are away to Germany, 27th of October. And as always... It's good to have Rich Laverty back on the show to talk about it. Rich, you okay? Yeah, I'm good, thanks you. Yes, all good, all things considered. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so the Lioness is back in action. It's been a while. It was, what was it, March time when they last played? Yeah, apart from obviously a couple of inter-team friendlies last month. Um, yeah, the last time we actually saw them play a team that wasn't an England team, um, yeah, would have been March when they got beat by Spain. That's right. I was in the the She Believes Cup. Mm. Um, I mean, you mentioned actually this um, England v England um, setup that they had in the last. Oh, it was the last squad get together. Did that did that work out quite well? Did you see? It was interesting. Yeah, we got invited to the first game, and I think it was strange because obviously it was the first time they'd been together in a long time, and, and not usually. They don't usually play against each other like that, where it's full teams, obviously. Some of them come up against each other at club level. But it was um, yeah, it was interesting, but it wasn't you know hugely representative, I don't think, of where England are as a team, whether they're higher or lower than that. I don't know. But um, it was fun. It was fun to watch You know them going up against each other. And obviously, it was a great opportunity for some of the youngsters that were involved, the likes of Ella Toon and uh, Millie Turner and Lotta Wubbermoy and Neve Charles, you know, players like that some of whom are uh, involved again and they've got another inter-team friendly a week on Friday and then they go to Germany I think I assume the day after and obviously then they play they play Germany on uh, on the Tuesday so yeah it's going to be interesting to see where they're at but I think you know friendlies I don't think you can often read too much into them and I think right now you can probably read as, as little into them as ever I think it is just you know it's preparation at the moment hopefully for for Tokyo but you know Fingers crossed that goes ahead. I think everything's up in the air at the moment. So uh, it's been a huge build-up to Tokyo over the last year or so. And if it doesn't happen, it's going to be a real... um, It's going to be a a right old anticlimax. It is, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, just... Yeah, you imagine it... The the Olympics not happening is is almost, I think, bigger than than perhaps, say, uh, a a football international tournament not happening. Um, Mm. I mean, a World Cup, obviously, you'd hate to lose. But I don't know, it just feels like a... uh, to not have an Olympics would be mm. would be quite something. Yeah, I think I think the fact that you've got every country sort of embarking on one location, I think hopefully they can do it. It will obviously take a lot of testing and a lot of protocols in place to get it on. But you know, we don't know where we're going to be in what is it August next year's ten months away. So um, hopefully we're in a better position by then. Anyway, let's hope so. Um, I mean. Squad wise, um, we've got some some new faces, as you say, Millie Turner, Esme Morgan, Ella Toon. Uh, they've got their uh, got another call up, as it were, and hopefully they can get a uh, a bit of game time this time. Yeah, it'd be nice to see them sort of get official caps. Um, they all played in the inter team friendlies. They did very well. Ella Toon came on and scored. Uh, I think Esme Morgan scored in the second game. Millie Turner did well. Neve Charles was very lively, playing at right back and. 
I think they're the four that are in again. Obviously, there's a few come back in. Nikita Paris is back in. Good to see Izzy Christensen in as well because she's been excellent for Everton so far this season. And yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I wrote yesterday it's about preparing now for the, the major tournaments that are coming up. And, you know, I think Phil, we're seeing a pattern now in terms of the young players that he is selecting and putting his faith in and, and trying to embed into his squad maybe not for the olympics i think given how small the squad will be you know mm. there's 28 players in this squad instantly you have to cut 10 for tokyo and that's without then thinking about the additions of, of welsh scottish or northern irish players but i think he is somewhat now setting the squad up for obviously the handover to um to serena next year by starting to to embed some of the younger players into the squad no, it's it's good good foresight, I guess, and, and and probably a good way to or the right way to be doing it. Uh, and another thing, of obviously, Lucy Bronze is is back in England now, playing for Manchester City. Is that a good thing? Do you think? Um, I hope so. I think Lucy, she's probably. I don't know whether she's still at the peak. I think we've got so used to her peak. You know, we got so used to a consistent performance level. I think. Personally, for me, she's maybe not at the level she was potentially two or three years ago, but she's still, you know, probably still the best right back in the world. But I think I say she's not that level. I think it's more a case of we've just got used to it. We've taken it for granted. So it's not we don't watch Lucy Bronze anymore and look at her as the standout and go, oh, you know, what a perform. We just we sort of used to her being like that. It's accepted Um, now. Yeah, it's, it's just you're sort of used to how Lucy Bronze plays. It's not. You know, you don't look at her anymore. You're sort of looking at the younger players and seeing what they can do because we know what Lucy's going to do. And yeah, it's great to have her back. You know, obviously, all the talk of the Americans and, and other big internationals that have come into the league. But, you know, I've been equally as excited by having Lucy back and Alex and, you know, Rachel Daly and Jess Fishlock and players like that that have come back after, you know, some of them have been away a long, long time. So, yeah, it's great for Lucy. I hope it's good for her development. I mean, it's hard probably to find anywhere where you'll develop as well as you would at Leon um, in terms of the players you play with and against and, and the trophies that you win. But I think she did everything she could do there. She was there for three years and she won three Champions Leagues. And I think, you know, obviously she's got a bit of unfinished business with Man City um, in t- trying to take them all the way in Europe and um, yeah, hopefully it just gives her a bit of a freshen up and uh, you know, maybe just gives her a, another level to a game if there is another level to find. And as well, I'm guessing that these, these younger players, if they get the chance to, to just play alongside her, even in, in training games, it's, it's great for them as well, just to even to train alongside her, talk to her about her experiences and that sort of thing is, is great for them. Yeah, and I think about players like Lauren Hemp and obviously not in the squad she's injured at the moment and Chloe Kelly you know they will train up against Lucy you know every day at Manchester City whether it's Lauren playing on the left Chloe playing on the left you know they will train against Lucy Bronze and you know they'll do the same with England and I think you know Chloe Chloe Kelly particularly is is becoming a, a top top player you know I have to admit I was a little bit she had a great season with Everton but I was a little bit you know yeah. Is she going to step up? You know, with Manchester City, is she going to have what it takes? And and so far, she's been absolutely unbelievable. To be honest, she's probably been their player of the season um, mm-hmm. so far. And I think you see, you know, trading with these players every day, you know, it is helping them. You know, Neve Charles. You know, there was a few questions asked by people when she went to Chelsea because obviously they've got Sam Kerr and they've got Beth England and Penile Harder and Erin Cuthbert and Frank Kirby, but. You know, training with those players every day, that's what people don't see, you know, that improvement that you're learning off. You know, she's playing with two of the best forwards in the world in Penile Harder and Sam Kerr. You know, if you're not learning from that, you're not going to learn from anybody. So I think the fact that we're seeing those players come into the England squad and, and flourishing shows that, you know, it, you're right. It's it's working for them, you know, training with these players day in, day out, whether that is with England or, you know, back with their club teams. Yeah. So Germany are the opposition, 27th, 27th of October. What what do we know about Germany? I mean, you know, Germany are Germany, aren't they? They're always mm. tough to play against. You know, they came to Wembley last year, yeah. less than a year ago. Feels like it was about a decade ago now. 
when we all made a big deal about 78,000 fans in Wembley and obviously now, you know, not even going to have 78 people probably in uh, in stadiums. But it was a tough game then. You know, Germany, for me on the night, were by far the better team. Um, they've got some really exciting young players. They've got a few out. I think I saw Alex Pop had pulled out the other day. But, you know, a bit like England, they've got a real bunch of talented young players coming into their squad and obviously you've got your likes of Jennifer Marajan still you know one of the best players in the world and I think they're a work in progress still but I, I think they're a very strong team at the moment I think Martina Vostecklenburg has got them playing very well they're a very solid outfit and, and with the exciting youngsters like Sir Clara Bull up front uh, who scored last season and you know Leah Schuller another really good young striker that you know obviously Lena Oberdorf we talk a lot about at the back who went to Wolfsburg only 17 18 years old you add in the really experienced players like your Marajans and you know I think they're in a good position to um, to challenge and they've got nothing to lose at the minute you know they're not at the Olympics next year they're just preparing for the Euros and I think they'll go out have a good go play good football and um, yeah I, I think they're probably favourites somewhat for the game I think in terms of the quality they have but I think I think it'd be even I think it'd be a good game they're, they're always close games when England play Germany and um, you know it's a good test you know I want to see Neve Charles I want to see Millie Turner I want to see Ella Toon and, and Alessia Russo and you know Chloe Kelly because you know we know what Lucy Bronze can do against Germany and we mm. know what Ellen White can do and Jill Scott and Jordan Nobbs you know, you know it's all well and good bringing them in, and it's good experience for them to be around the camp. You know, for you're on camp for probably, you know, nearly two weeks, and you know you're living in each other's pockets twenty four seven, and they need that. You know, they train with them every day, but you know, put them on, put them up against you know the likes of Marajan and, and Oberdorf and Schuller and you know whoever else they decide to play because that's what they need. You know, they need exposure to that now. Yeah, yeah you're right. And you mentioned there about been no spectators um, as we we're all fully aware about at the moment but I saw a there's another fixture for the Lionesses which is coming up in December uh, where we'll be playing Norway and and I looked at where it's being played at Bramall Lane in Sheffield and I thought well I wonder whether yourself might be able to squeeze into that one in some sort of capacity yeah I mean media have generally been able to go to games anyway um, like I said we got invited to the behind closed doors friendly at the last camp I know some of my colleagues are going out to Germany next week okay. for the uh, for the friendly so I think we will be able to go to Bramall Lane I think it will probably be limited it was the same you know, I went to the community shield last month I think they let about eight media in or something like that right. so obviously Bramall Lane the press area is a little bit tighter it, it did get all completely redone last season because obviously Premier League, yep. you have to meet certain, you know, uh, requirements in terms of the media. So it, it did get redone, but it was quite tight the last time I was up there. I mean, I go to Bramall Lane quite a lot. Um, I'm there actually on Monday with our under twenty threes, and it's uh, it's a great state. And every time I go, you know, it's become sort of second nature, sort of working there now. You know, from time to time, whether it's games or meetings and whatnot, and I still always think, you know there's going to be a European Championship, you know, held at this stadium. And I think Bramall Lane has one of the semi-finals, possibly England semi-final. And yeah, it's strange. It's strange that a stadium that's, you know, sort of become home somewhat is going to be like that. I just keep thinking how good it'll be to actually go to a, a big major tournament game or even an England friendly, like you say, next month. And, you know, be able to be back at my house in half an hour, you know, rather than be at a, an Airbnb or a hotel or... You know, jumping in a foreign taxi somewhere and actually just just walk out of the stadium, get the train, yeah. and and I'm home in you know 20 minutes. So, yeah, it'd be uh, if we can go, great. You know, it'd be great to watch an England game there. I went to the Continental Cup final there a couple of years ago, and um, yeah, I think um, it'd be great. It's great for Sheffield United, and it's great for it's great to have the Lionesses back up back up in the north again. Shame we won't be able to have fans. You know, it's a great stadium for when it's full up. Um, and I think, you know, it'd be near near full for a big England game. But it is what it is, obviously, the situation at the moment. But hopefully it's still uh, it's still a good game because Norway are a very good team. Yeah. 
Well, let's uh, let's catch up nearer the time um, about that one, and and we'll get fingers crossed. Maybe things may have just uh, have just changed a little bit. We'll, we shall wait and see. Hopefully, Rich. Thank you as always. No problem. Thanks to Rich there. Pretty much rounding this episode off for us. Good luck to the Lionesses later this month. I think we've covered everything now. Thanks also to Aidan and Matt. And we'll do it all again next month as we take on Belgium and Iceland. And possibly A.N. Other. But still to come this month, I have a couple of other episodes that I hope you can join me for. Thanks as always for listening. Please do tell your friends. Pass it all about. Leave a review on iTunes if you're going that way. All that sort of stuff. That'll do. So until the next time, look after yourselves. Whatever lockdown tier you're in, stay safe and stay subscribed. Cheers. Thank you.